By 18 BC, a shrewd politician and master manipulator named Caesar Augustus had effectively curtailed competition within the Roman Senate and military through savvy political maneuvering. Having thusly disempowered his contenders, Augustus secured his legal position as head of the Roman Empire. But for his sister, Octavia Thurina, Rome under her brother's authority seemed a darker place than the Rome into which she had been born, although it hardly seemed possible given she had grown up amidst the turmoil of Lucius Sergius Catalina's conspiracy to overthrow the government and Marcus Tullius Cicero's execution of Roman citizens without trial. She had lived through the times of the Collegia Gang Wars led by Publius Clodius Polka and the barbaric conquest of Gaul led by her great-uncle, Julius Caesar. In addition to navigating the civil war between Caesar and Pompeius Magnus, she had even endured the military struggle between her brother and her husband, Marcus Antonius. Octavius' steely character had emerged from not only continual conflict, but from the horrors of the civil wars, which loomed large over an entire generation of Romans. But with the civil wars finally at an end, life had failed to return to normal. Rome was forever changed. Her brother, no longer Caesar D.V. Filius, but now called Caesar Augustus, all the revered, ruled over all. Backed by the military might of Rome's legions, Augustus simultaneously held the authority of a tribune of the plebs, a sitting consul, and a proconsul. These offices granted him imperium, which made his person legally inviolable within the city of Rome, as well as in her many provinces. As Cura Anane, Octavius' brother also controlled Rome's grain supply, much of which now flowed from Egypt, an entire province which had become his personal property, and where he also reigned as pharaoh of the new Roman dynasty in the east. He had even been granted the right to establish Rome's moral code, rising above the office of censor. The son of Rome's newest god, Caesar Divus, Augustus was now the embodiment of the law in Rome. He was not only Rome's source of nourishment, but also the superintendent of Roman virtue. Yet, for all his power and prowess, Octavius' brother had no son of his own to whom this legacy might be passed. During the civil war years, he had first married Claudia Pulchra, daughter of Fulvia and Publius Clodius Pulcha. However, he ended this marriage when Fulvia raised troops in a failed attempt to overthrow him militarily. Next, as part of a treaty to end the famine caused by Sextus Pompeius's naval blockade of Italy, Caesar Augustus married Pompeius's aunt, Scribonia Libo. However, on the day Scribonia gave birth to his daughter Julia, he divorced her so that he could marry Livia Drusilla, the illustrious and pregnant wife of another man. Livia belonged to the gens Claudiae, one of Rome's most ancient patrician lineages, she already had a son named Tiberius by her first husband and was expecting his second son, Drusus, when she divorced him to marry Octavia's brother. But Livia could not give a son to Caesar Augustus. As a result, Octavia's brother now turned his attention toward his sister's thriving nursery. From her first marriage to Gaius Claudius Marcellus, Octavia had two daughters named Marcella and a son named Marcellus. With her second husband, Marcus Antonius, Octavia not only had two more daughters, Antonia and Antonilla, but she became the caretaker of Antonius's sons from his previous marriage, Antillus and Eulis, as well as the guardian of the three children Egypt's Queen Cleopatra had given him, twins Helios and Selene, and a toddler named Philadelphus. In his quest for an heir, Augustus would choose Octavia's son, Marcellus, plucking him from her brood and transporting him, alongside his stepson Tiberius, to Gispania, where both would begin their military training. Upon his return to Rome, Marcellus was named Aedile by Caesar Augustus and put in charge of the Ludi Romani festival for the 23 BC year. Yet, while publicly appointing her son to this office before he was of legal age, Octavius' brother concurrently expanded the authority of his first-hand man, Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, the architect of Caesar Augustus's military victories. Agrippa was also Octavius' son-in-law, having married her eldest daughter Marcella. 
And so, as her son Marcellus publicly basked in the anticipation and certainty of a brilliant political career, Agrippa's stature was being inconspicuously elevated within the Senate, making his position second only to that of Augustus. Before long, rumors began to circulate of a rift between Marcellus, who had support from among the senatorial elite, and Agrippa, who was loved by the legions. In the minds of many, Augustus' obvious favoritism of his nephew was perceived as unjust and disrespectful treatment of Agrippa, casting Rome's savior in a negative light. What was Augustus to do? Suddenly, in 23 BC, the great man fell ill, reportedly struck down by the same plague which had claimed many lives across Italy. Gathering all to his deathbed, the princeps civitatis officially delegated his governmental responsibilities. To the consul Piso, he assigned Rome's financial ledgers and an accounting of the empire's provinces. But through the passing of his signet ring, Augustus handed the legions over to Agrippa. For Marcellus, there was nothing. Then Caesar Augustus miraculously recovered. His deathbed scene had served only to foment further division, which ultimately gave rise to an assassination plot. When Agrippa left Rome and journeyed to the island of Lesbos to begin discreet negotiations with Parthian ambassadors, it was whispered that he had been quietly exiled so that Augustus could comfortably groom his nephew. And though Marcellus, a member of the same illustrious Claudier to which Livia belonged, possessed a family name that could win him the support of Rome's senatorial elite, what good was their support if none but Agrippa could command the loyalty of Rome's military? Rome's legions were not likely to follow a 19-year-old boy simply because he had a grand name. With the military supporting Agrippa and the aristocracy behind Marcellus, Caesar Augustus found himself trapped. He wanted an heir on whom to bestow his legacy, but that legacy was clearly underwritten by Rome's legions, and the legions favored Agrippa over Marcellus. Then, in 23 BC, while vacationing in Baiae with his wife Julia, the daughter of Caesar Augustus, Octavia's son suddenly fell ill and died, under mysterious circumstances. Officially, Marcellus's cause of death was the same pandemic disease which had threatened the life of Augustus and had devastated all of Italy throughout the 23 BC year. Curiously, Marcellus's demise brought instant healing to a fractured republic. Now, only one road led to Augustus's Rome. Marcus Agrippa, who was still on the island of Lesbos when Marcellus died, could straightaway return to Rome, not only with the support of the legions, but also with the goodwill of the Senate. To make certain his intentions were clear to both the Senate and the legions, Augustus offered his newly widowed daughter as wife to Agrippa, a proposal Agrippa did not hesitate to accept. Upon returning to Rome, Agrippa divorced Octavia's daughter, Marcella, and promptly married Julia. This marriage, which established a single path to Rome's dynastic future through Augustus's daughter, also spawned a slew of political alliances in the immediate years to follow. Not only did Agrippa's daughter by his first marriage formally wed Tiberius, the son of Livia Drusilla, but his two daughters by Marcella, both named Fitzania Marcella, were suddenly sought out as future brides by aristocratic families who would have previously thumbed their noses at the Vipsaniae. But Octavia, the bereaved mother of Marcellus, began making political alliances of a different sort. She immediately arranged for her newly divorced daughter, Marcella, to wed her stepson, Ulysses Antonius. Her second Marcella may have married Publius Clodius Polka, the stepson of Marcus Antonius from his marriage to Fulvia. For Antonia, her third daughter, Octavia honored the betrothal arrangement negotiated by Marcus Antonius before his death, and so Antonia married Lucius Domitius Enobarbus, whose father had opposed Octavia's brother. Octavia's fourth daughter, Antonilla, was betrothed to Drusus, the second son of Livia Drusilla. As matriarch to six children born to Marcus Antonius, Octavia now gained sons-in-law who eternalized the memory of Antonius, the very man who had warned all that it was Caesar, Octavia's own brother, who was preventing a restoration of the Republic. And while many may have assumed that it was Augustus who arranged the marriages of his nieces, we are told that it was Octavia Thurina, 
the same woman who had opposed her brother on multiple occasions, who arranged Marcella's marriage to Ulysses. By proudly allying herself with Antonian sympathizers while perpetually dressing in mourning clothes, Octavia may have been making a subtle statement about whom she considered responsible for the death of her son. For a decade, Octavia had watched as her brother had stifled a competitive spirit that had once catapulted Rome to greatness, leashing all opposition under the guise of maintaining harmony. And early on, she had come to know the worthlessness of his word through his many broken promises to her husband. Had Octavia's son been sacrificed on the altar of her brother Augustus's desire to consolidate his power of the Senate and the legions via the single most useful heir? Is it any wonder that the state funeral and eulogies that followed his mysterious death, coming on the heels of his having been promoted as the future of Rome, depicted Marcellus as nearly divine, and his death as nearly a religious event? Not only was Marcellus the first to be buried in the grand new mausoleum Caesar Augustus had constructed, but the theatre being built alongside the Tiber River was now dedicated to his memory. Caesar Augustus even ordained that a special gilded chair be brought into the newly named Theatre of Marcellus each year afterwards to celebrate the Ludi Romani, the festival which Marcellus had overseen as Edile. In addition to the theatre and a public library which Octavia dedicated to her son's memory, commemorative verses were inscribed into an epic poem titled The Aeneid. In the sixth book of this monumental Roman foundation story, meant to be the Latin rival of Homer's Odyssey and Iliad, the author, Publius Virgilius Maro, known to history as Virgil, leads his protagonist, Aeneas, down into the underworld, where he meets the splendid spirit of a would-be warrior shrouded in tragedy. He is, Marcellus, announces Aeneas's father grinly, when queried by Aeneas about the tragic young man's identity. The Aeneid then proclaims the loss of Marcellus so terrible by vividly detailing the grandeur of his funeral that the world might never forget how desolately Rome wept for the prince who was not. We are told that upon hearing a private reading given by Virgil of his unfinished epic masterpiece, Octavia became so overcome with grief that she fainted. After recovering, Octavia paid Virgil ten thousand sesterces for each verse about her son, and then retired from public life altogether.